I'm honored and privileged and delighted to welcome Mayor Nir Barkat to this very well attended ZOA webinar. Mayor Bar Barkat, you may not realize what an auspicious moment this may be in your political career. I say that because the last major Israeli official we had on this webinar became the Prime Minister of Israel. That's Naftali Bennett. So this bodes well for your future if you're interested. Uh, Mayor Barkat is an Israeli a very successful Israeli businessman, public official. He was a major in the IDF. <laughs> he's uh, founded a number of high-tech software companies. Uh, he's been the mayor of Jerusalem for, he was a mayor of Jerusalem for 10 years. He dramatically improved in Jerusalem, the culture, the tourism, the social welfare uh, programs, the local high-tech. In fact, Jerusalem was uh, named the number one emerging high-tech hub uh, uh, in the world. Uh, he also hosted the first international marathon in 2011 uh, in Israel, and in 2015 he joined the Likud party, and there are rumors that uh, Mayor Barkat may be running to be the head of Likud uh, when Benjamin Netanyahu steps down. So it is a great honor and privilege uh, to have such a distinguished, knowledgeable, and uh, accomplished guest as Mayor Nir Barkat. Mayor Nir Barkat, thank you so much for being with us. We'll look forward to your words. Thank you very much, Mort. Um, uh, to you and Alan and, and Danilo is my friend and all the people watching. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, with your permission, uh, let me say a few words about uh, uh, myself and then the situation and then we'll very quickly dive into the challenges of uh, Judea and Samaria. Uh, I decided uh, to take my knowledge and experience as an entrepreneur uh, and as a, as a businessman, uh, somebody that understands technology uh, and uh, moved to, the pub to public service 19 years ago when I was 42. Uh, 10 years of, out of which I was mayor of Jerusalem and well aware of the big challenges of uh, our country. Uh, they all sat on my table uh, and decided to move to the national level to take that experience uh, to all the places of Israel, all the land of Israel, and all the people of Israel. Uh, and uh, actually last Thursday, it may, some of you may have been in a, in a conference I uh, put together, that talks about the vision, my vision to Israel. I uh, shared my vision as, a, as an entrepreneur and, that, and a, somebody that understands technology um, and innovation uh, and bring it to a number of areas of our future. Uh, security, economy, education, and last but not least, how I believe we could change Israel's periphery. Uh, and that will be uh, the subject uh, matter of our discussion, focusing on uh, Judea and Samaria. Uh, these are tough times for us uh, in the Likud and uh, on the national, uh, us, uh, uh, the nationalists in our country. Uh, you know, I was in the Knesset today and it's sad, it's very sad to see how, how sad the Knesset is. And uh, there's, it's very clear to me that a lot of the things that we're, you're going to hear today, we will not be able to uh, develop because of this new government, because of uh, the structure of the government. Uh, and so a good example of what we will not be able to do in the near future, unfortunately, are uh, taking my plan to the next level and executing and fulfilling it and pushing it aggressively, pursuing it around the world with, with the United States of America. Uh, and this is sad. However, I do believe that, uh, um, that we have to work very, very uh, uh, wisely. And what I intend to do in, 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 the, in, the, in the future is show uh, my vision to the new government and explain to Naftali Bennett and uh, Gidon Saar and share with them what they cannot do, what they cannot do in the current structure of the government. 
and remind them all that in order to execute the plan that you're gonna to see today, they must join the Likud and have a nationalistic uh, uh, coalition. Uh, and so it's a, it's a great honor for me to share with you and, and zoom in on the plan of Yudav Shamon because this is exactly what I'm gonna sit and show them all the time. Here's what we must do and, that, and you're not doing. And, and hopefully pull them, pull them our way. Uh, I'm totally committed uh, to uh, help Netanyahu, the head of the Likud, and with the rest of the team, I'm totally committed to do everything we can to replace the government with a, a nationalistic government led by the Likud. And with your permission, let me dive into the plan. Um, okay, um, this is a three-year plan. Uh, we've actually finalized it um, a few months ago. Uh, and the plan looks at, I would like to share with you four elements of the plan. The first, uh, let me start with, uh, uh, with the economy. Uh, um, almost three years ago, I decided to uh, work with Professor Michael Porter from Harvard Business School and to develop a plan uh, of how to dramatically improve the economy of Judea and Samaria. Professor Michael Porter from Harvard Business School, his methodology, which I implied uh, and got his blessing on it, talks about let's go to Judea and Samaria, let's see what works and try to figure out what business clusters work today in Yudav Shomon. And once we understand the competitive advantage of Yudav Shomon relative to other parts of the country, let's boost um, by uh, smart tax incentives and grants, let's boost very, very aggressively the growth of success, successful business, uh, businesses in, in the region. Uh, and so uh, I will jump to the re relevant uh, part with your permission. And yeah, and that is uh, 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 Judea Samaria's uh, economy. The first element is if you go to Barkan, Ariel, Mishore Dumim, these are industrial zones that uh, have, uh, let me see one second with your permission. Yeah, industrial zones that uh, are uh, very, very successful. And you find what kind of businesses work well in those industrial zones. And you find that uh, we're talking about companies and corporations that have good technology, the technology rich on one hand, but then they also need land, cheap land and cheap labor. So Balkan and Ariel and all the current zones in, in, in Judea and Samaria, currently uh, there are about 15,000 Israelis and 25,000 Palestinians working in these industrial zones. What surprised us is how successful these companies are. So what we did is we developed a new plan and you can see it on the, uh, right in front of you. Uh, and that is expanding and adding additional industrial zones that call for 10X land, 10 times more than we have today. This is a 30 year plan. Uh, and uh, we've allocated um, the green areas that you may see. Some of the, 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 the dark green are current places that we want to expand and the uh, lighter uh, green are new industrial zones and all together they host 10 times more land than the current uh, uh, situation. Mind you that these are successful uh, companies and we want to enable them to grow. What is unique about this plan is that once you already create a zone, uh, you can have logistical centers there. You can also have front end hospitals that uh, support both Israelis and Palestinians. You can have an array of uh, new businesses because these are areas that are uh, uh, secured. Uh, we prefer them as close as possible to the security fence. And this plan is a classic win-win uh, uh, deal with, the, with both for Israelis and Palestinians. Just to give you an example, you see here um, a very interesting uh, point. Uh, our GDP, the average uh, uh, Israeli salary is about $42,000 a year. The Arabs across the fence every day, there are about 75 to 100,000 if you count the, the illegal ones, um, is about $16,000 a year. 
In our industrial zones, there are about 25,000 employees. They get 11,000. The other parts of Judea and Samaria is less than 7,000. And in Gaza, it is much less than, th that number is too rich, the 5,000. It's closer to 2,000. Meaning the more the Arabs, uh, the Palestinians cooperate with the Jewish state, the better off they are. And long-term, it'll do the same for us. So that's one area. Uh, and therefore you have that map that we shared with you, um, which is an execution plan. This is the plan to execute. It's ready to rock and roll. It is all based on Israeli state-owned land in area C. And the map you see, the road maps, um, the, the roads connecting it, is the new uh, road map, the new roads developed by the Israeli government to tailor and to uh, uh, help us scale uh, in the next uh, 20, 30 years. Okay, this is the first element. The second element, uh, the, um, it, it, really what surprised me, we went to see Shiloh. Uh, hopefully some of you have been to Shiloh, which is uh, uh, where the tabernacles um, rested after our great, great grandparents came back from Egypt to the land of Israel. Uh, and the tabernacles uh, was in Shiloh for 369 years, if I'm not mistaken, before Jerusalem was built. So that was the center of the universe, if you'd like. Uh, and what, I, what amazed me is when we went to see the place, they have 40,000 evangelical uh, visitors a year. I was shocked, 40,000, which gave us the inspiration to create what we call the land of the Bible. And here's a map of over 20 Bible stories that each of them is in their own real location, as much as we can uh, uh, can, can uh, think of, okay? And uh, together, they tell the story of the Bible. And the idea is we have, uh, we did market research with a um, um, Spanish firm that uh, focuses on uh, uh, niches in tourism. Seven out of 10 Americans and four out of 10 Europeans would love to go and see the Bible uh, story. And so the goal is to create a new theme, uh, rich in history, rich in Bible. Nobody could ever compete for, for religious people, the people that re respect the Bible. There's only 700 million evangelicals uh, and of course Jews that would be interested to see uh, these stories. And so we would market them. Uh, you know, uh, my wife is an ex-South African and when we go to Africa Remember the big five, right? The big five big animals. We wanna make sure that people then come to Israel. If they have not seen some of these stories of the Bible, it's as if though they've never been to the land of the Bible and market it in a smart way, of course, jointly with Jerusalem uh, to create a huge growth in tourism. What this company also did is they mentioned to us a very, very uh, uh, an important point that people that come to Jerusalem, the people that come to Israel and they see the land of the Bible, they go back home as a great ambassadors of the state of Israel. They understand who owns this land. When they go and see um, the Bible stories like Shiloh and the rest of them, uh, where King David wrote Psalm, that's uh, in the Southern part of uh, Hebron, uh, or uh, uh, the story of the ladder in Bethel, uh, Jacob's dream, and develop these stories uh, into real things that they can feel and they will never go back home the same. So this is one huge investment in actually telling all the world who owns every inch of the land of Israel. So this is the second plan. The third element, which I wanna share with you um, has to do, let me open a, a, a wider angle a second and, and share with you one of the biggest challenges we have in Israel. 30 years from now, when Israel will be about 100 years old, the population of Israel will double. Today we're 9 million, we will be around 18 million people. Now the key question is, where are the additional 9 million gonna live? Right now, everyone is going to the center, Gedera Chedera, and unfortunately, the strong demand uh, for entrepreneurs, quality of life, 
a lot of the people want to move to the center. It's going to be a disaster if this trend continues uh, in 30 years from now. Traffic, uh, condensment, it's going to be terrible. But even worse than that, what is going to happen to Israel's periphery? Galil Golan, Negev Arava, Yehuda Veshomron. I understand that the solution to the, 30, uh, to, to the 18 million people in 30 years from now is Israel's periphery. Uh, rather than speak uh, to, to, uh, to these re regions as periphery, I would prefer to call them uh, the regions of Israel, the north, the south, Yehuda Veshomron, that we have to develop and we have to maintain and make sure we don't lose them. Uh, because if we neglect them and not, we need another million Jews to live in the north in the next 30 years. One and a half more million Jews to live in Yudav Shomron, and one and a half more uh, Jews to live in, uh, in, in the Negev and the Arava. And for, to do that, you must rethink structurally. You have to rethink the focus of Israeli government. Um, and when I learned the details I asked the government, give me your plans. Where are you planning to build buildings? Where, where are you planning for people to uh, move in? And the reality is that the government gave in and they're focusing on where there is a demand. So the government is focusing on supplying the demand in the center of the country. And my strategy is to create demand, to create demand in Israel's periphery. And once you do that, that's the north, the south, and Yudav Shomron, you could actually develop and pull many, many more people to live in Yudav Shomron. And what amazed me is that the central government of Israel is not planning Yudav Shomron. Nobody's planning the growth. There's no top-down planning uh, for Yudav Shomron. What happens there is that we've got 24 Moatzot uh, Mekomiot, um, local governments, that each want to develop another hill and more housing, but that's the wrong way to plan Yudav Veshomon. So I raised a million shekels and with Kohelet, uh, we sat down to rethink and structure how we're gonna fit in two million Jews, Israelis in Yudav Veshomon. And that's the, uh, the next plan I wanna show you. So the way to think about it um, is the next map. I sat down as mayor of Jerusalem and I said, let's think metropolitan centers. And when you look at the, the four major metropolitan areas of Israel, you've got the center, Tel Aviv, you've got Haifa, uh, you've got Jerusalem in the center and you've got Be'er Sheva. And if you look for a second in the green line, I actually don't care about the green line. When we start planning Yudav Shomon, then the western side of Shomron is actually the east side of Gujdan. And Drom Ar Hevron is north Be'er Sheva. Binyamin is north of Jerusalem, is, is in the north part of Jerusalem. And when you analyze where people live, uh, where they work, where they uh, uh, do business or get some their services, you will find that they get pulled to the different metropolitan areas. So the planning, uh, that uh, the, the fundamental thinking of the planning of uh, uh, how to scale to 2 million Israelis is forget about the green line. What is much, much more important is the connection to the major metropolitan areas of Israel. So this is uh, the, the uh, shift in thinking. Now, we took that to the next level and you have here in, in these maps, um, a big matrix on the left that talks about, um, I think we have about 19 or 20 zones that together create Judea and Samaria. Look at the color code. The, what is uh, uh, purple here is actually more oriented towards Tel Aviv. The gold is of course, Jerusalem. The uh, red at the bottom is connected to Be'er Sheva or Lachish. The green right there in the center uh, is actually um, areas that we want to put around the city of Ariel and to scale Ariel. And, uh, and on, on the right side, um, we have uh, Bikat Erden, okay, which is a little bit separate than anything else. It's a tougher challenge to plan. 
Okay, so what you have here is the 400,000 people that live there today. And the left column is where we know how to fit over 2 million Israelis. This plan, by the way, is signed by all of the 24 of the local governments of Yudav Shomon. Let me show you the number here. Here they are, okay? All of the 24 uh, major uh, local leadership, all of them are part of the plan. What I did is I went to them and showed them the plan. They gave me their input. We went back again and after three or four iterations and over two years, we got to, to this plan. And what you see here, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, um, it is based on um, our experience where the harder, the, the, the stronger colors are uh, what we want as 30% of the land. I, I don't know, I don't wanna bother you with all the details, but if you're really interested, um, we have a, we can send you the plan. You could look at it and, and learn all about it. So if I have to summarize my point so far, the first thing I started is working with Professor Michael Porter on economic growth, because I understand that until you have your economy right and you could scale the number of uh, jobs and you could bring through the economy uh, more prosperity, this is something the world accepts. I've been demonstrating this uh, in Israel and in Europe and in the United States. And I have to tell you that people, it's hard for them to say no to this plan because they understand it's win-win deal both to Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, then the second story is the Bible land, the land of the Bible. Huge win, huge upside to share with the world who owns this land and, and everywhere you put a shovel in the ground, we find Jewish roots there. Uh, and the third element is how we scale the infrastructure and fit 2 million uh, Jews. The fourth element is the road plans. The road plans that we proposed are a, net, a, a network um, of uh, roads that connect um, between all the Israelis to, 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 between themselves. And you have a roadmap for Palestinians that connect between the Palestinians and, them, and themselves. There are a few points that uh, we're gonna have bridges and tunnels to enable these two networks to work separately, um, which is very, very important. Uh, God forbid in, in times of, of, uh, of challenges, security challenges, you can actually enable the Israelis to flow uh, and uh, uh, close areas that uh, we may have threats from, uh, terror threats or violence. So integrated into the road plan is a security uh, fallback that you could actually develop the quality of life for Israelis and Palestinians separately, uh, but be able to very, very wisely uh, use the roadmap for security, uh, for improving security. So these are the four elements of Judea and Samaria. And last thing before we open up for Q&A, um, I've been working lately on uh, thinking wisely how to work with local municipalities in Judea and Samaria. Uh, for example, Hebron, Ramallah, Jenin, and actually develop their independence, develop their ability to do deals with Israel, uh, with, with, with us uh, in a way that uh, recognizes the fact that they're in many, many ways, tribal thinking. You know, the Emirates is a great example of how different tribes work together. Uh, they have their independence, each Emirate has their, uh, their own independence and they work together as a group. In many ways, I believe that uh, we should take a serious look and how to develop our economy with each of the sort of tribes, if you'd like, local governments, um, to, to develop a, um, a better economy between the Israelis and the Palestinians in those regions. It must be done in a way that we have little dependency on them, uh, but the thinking of enabling more localization and more uh, uh, the Emirates is, is sort of the model, I believe could lead us into something uh, very wise long-term, uh, which is uh, we of course do not agree with the Palestinian state. That is a huge threat to Israel and we must never agree to that. But also we cannot have one state because it's a huge uh, demographic risk. 
And so the, the model of autonomy that enables the Palestinians to, uh, 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 to have their, all their rights, uh, all practical purpose rights, uh, but also to work with us more on a local level, I believe is the right direction uh, for Yudha uh, Vishamon. And I've been working on this model with the friends in Kohelet, of course, uh, and all of the local governments. So I'm very, very honored and, and, and proud uh, to have this map or to have the plan uh, on the table. I've showed this uh, to, um, to many people in the Likud and the government. Uh, and this plan is the right thing to do. Now what we need to do is make sure that Tikva uh, Chadasha and Yamina join us to develop this plan because with the current government, this cannot be done, unfortunately. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but uh, it looks like we have to work very, very hard to restructure a new government uh, and uh, push, push this plan forward. This is, uh, I'll stop here and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mkhenir Barkat. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to give the opportunity, first of all, I want to say personally that this was absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's not the first time I hear it, and every time I hear it, I understand it a little bit more because uh, it, there's a lot of very fascinating details. I want to give uh, uh, Mort Klein the opportunity to ask the first question. Well, I agree with Dan. That was really an extraordinary presentation. I've never heard it. Very exciting, reminds me of the term we always hear, promised land. And the question should always be, who promised the land and to whom? Of course, it was God who promised the land to the Jews. We should always remember that. I also wanted to mention that I felt close to your family when I saw that your father, uh, Zalman Barkat, is a professor of physics at Hebrew University. And I spent many Indeed. years working with the uh, greatest chemical physicist in the world, Linus Pauling. So I felt very close to your family when I saw your father was in, in the field of physics. And um, so I wanted to ask you, do you agree with Naftali Bennett that we have to keep all of Area C, 60%, which I believe is about 60% of Judea and Samaria? Do we need to keep it? Is that something we absolutely should not negotiate in any way, shape, or form? And secondly, what is your position about America wanting to move the Palestinian Arab consulate to Jerusalem? Should Israel make it clear this is our sovereign capital city? We will not allow uh, an Arab consulate in our city? Uh, what do you propose uh, Israel should respond to the Biden administration with that, with that uh, uh, request? Okay, let's start with the, the, the ABC concept. Uh, I challenge the concept. And well, let me give you a, a small story to, to, to better understand my, my goal. Uh, when I was mayor of Jerusalem, I was... Uh, I needed to address rezoning and planning in neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, Tzur Bacher as, a, as an example. And so the residents came to me and they said, you know, we're like a village, we need more land. We need to expand because our quality of life is more, uh, reminds you of a, more of a village than a city like Yerushalayim. And I said, no, what's good for the West side in a symmetrical way, it's going to be good for the east side. What's good for the Israeli, for the, for the Jews, will be good for the Arabs. And I insisted that they go higher and they, uh, in English, to uh, more dense density. Yes, to yeah. Condense the building. Because in the west side, we go high to 20, 30, 40 stories. Um, and uh, with all the, the new tamot, uh, we enable people to add more stories. We must do the same in East Jerusalem. And eventually that's what happened. And when I went to, uh, when I started speaking to Europeans and to Americans, I said, hey guys, I don't understand what's going on here. If you want to remove a tree in Jerusalem, you have all the people, the green, uh, you know, the green people, uh, you know, you can't do anything. You can't take any piece of green land in our city and in our country and build on it. Legally, even, you can't do. Okay? You can't touch the forest. You can't do this. You can't do that. Now, I know that the Europeans and the Americans are also very sensitive to building in, uh, you know, in, open, uh, in, 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 in the open. The Palestinians today are building illegally 
in areas C, in areas B, in areas A, which is something I don't accept. From my perspective, there's no ABC. There is condense in your cities and we will condense in our areas. You leave maximum areas free. This is a new thought that I came with uh, a few months ago. And I said, wait a minute, forget about ABC. Okay, of course they're important. We will never give, uh, you, you mustn't get, you have enough land in A and B. And especially if you start condensing the buildings in 30 years from now, you all the Israelis fit in less than 10%. Two million Israelis will fit in less than 10% of the land. Today we're about 3%, just less than 3% of the land. Uh, and the Palestinians, if they add another uh, one and a half or two million people, uh, they could actually, you do, they don't need a lot of land. We must never let them build in area C. They have enough areas. And if, if we uh, demand sim symmetric, uh, symmetry, to be symmetrical in our thinking, here's how we condense and here's where you should condense and you have enough land uh, to leave it as is. Okay, hopefully Morton, uh, hopefully you understand that point. Now, uh, the consulate. The consulate, um, before the embassy moved to Jerusalem, there was a consulate in East Jerusalem, actually also in West side of the city. As a matter of fact, uh, once they moved uh, uh, um, the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, the Americans closed the embassy, uh, the, the consulate. Now, I believe that the right place to have the American consulate to deal with the Palestinians is Ramallah. Go to Ramallah and open up a consulate. We, we feel fine with that because that's where uh, the administration of the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Authority is right now headed and located. Um, so my recommendation is go to Ramallah. The problem is today I was uh, had some time with the, um, I, I said thank you to uh, um, our ambassador David Friedman and Mnuchin that uh, I met this morning uh, in, uh, here in the hotel in Jerusalem. And, and, and it's very clear that the, the new administration fears to open up a consulate in uh, Ramallah. They fear the Palestinians. And even if they don't say it, I believe that that's true. And so they are uh, gonna have to think where they open up uh, their services. Right now, the services given to uh, Palestinians is done uh, as part uh, here in Jerusalem. It's not new. But I think that we must put a demand or a request or uh, uh, ask the uh, Americans to focus on, um, on Ramallah. Um, if you're asking me, uh, do I think that they will do that? I'm not sure they will. So should Israel say no, that we will not permit a consulate? How should Israel respond? Well, there was a consulate uh, when I was mayor in East Jerusalem that dealt with the Palestinian issues. It's not uh, that it never existed and all of a sudden they want to move it. It was there before. And the question is, is it going to be in East Jerusalem or in West Jerusalem? Um, and what is the American uh, request here? I'm not uh, I'm part of the foreign affairs uh, uh, office, right? The ministry. Uh, but this is something that we have to negotiate with the Americans. Thank you. Thank God Thank you. the embassy is not moving. <laughs> And so I think that by moving the American embassy to Jerusalem, that's a huge, huge step. And thank God we're not going backwards on that one. So I think that uh, um, this is something that we really want to thank President Trump and his team. Yeah, thank you. Uh, before I get to other questions that were asked uh, in the chat and the q and I just want to bring up something that came up many, many times, just so you know, Nir. Uh, many people want to see the plan written and printed uh, in English in order to both read it the fully in English and also to send it to their friends. So if you send it to me, I'll send it to everyone who asked afterwards and, and we'll make sure it goes to whoever wants to wants to read it. Uh, okay. The, the first question is from national board member Brian uh, Grodman. Uh, he asked uh, if this plan has been shown to US officials and if so, what their response was. I showed the plan to uh... Uh, I went to the White House and I showed the plan uh, at the time to Jared Kushner. Um, 
on the side of the, econo of the economics, he really liked it. On the side of the planning, he was a little bit more cautious, but I, I showed him that the plan is the easiest thing we should do because if there's peace, there's no reason why we shouldn't expand on the, on the, the land of the Bible. And the footprint of the plan is 10%, as I said earlier. And if there's no peace, of course we should build there. So in any scenario, we should uh, focus on, on, on building the economy. And the road systems is something they liked as well because by connecting the roads and having uh, bridges and tunnels um, in the junctions between traffic that connects between Israelis and traffic that connects between Palestinians, by smart junctions, you dramatically improve quality of life for both Arabs and, uh, and, and, and Palestinians and Israelis. And, and by doing that, this is something that makes a lot of sense. So it's a one-time investment that enables virtually uh, to pe for people to connect. There was a big uh, uh, discussion I had with the administration. And of course I went through David Friedman and his team and, and, and many other officials, which are good friends of mine. Um, the, the vision of enabling, thinking about Judea and Samaria, not as a physical uh, division, but as a virtual, uh, as, a, as a virtual connection. I'm a high-tech entrepreneur, right? So imagine you have a virtual network of roads that connect all the Israelis and another one that connects all the Palestinians, okay? And wherever they cross junk, you know, cross correlate, then you have a smart junction that enables them to sort of feel free. So all of a sudden you have a virtual uh, two, two, you know, one autonomy in one state of Israel that virtually exists on the same piece of land. So they like that part very, very much. Um, what else can I say about the plan? I, I believe that uh, one of the biggest things that uh, we must do is very aggressively pursue the uh, notion of uh, industrial zones. Now, I heard some Democrats concerned about the plan because once you move ahead with it, the quality of life of the Arabs will dramatically improve and then maybe their motivation to have a Palestinian state will decrease. I said, okay, I agree with that, but what's the problem? I, I agree that that's, a, that that's something, so you, you don't want us to improve their quality of life, which is ridiculous. Uh, we do want to improve their quality of life by enabling another 250,000 jobs just on the industrial zones and a few tens of thousands on, on, on the whole issue of tourism. And, Let's improve their quality of life. Yeah, and by the way, by doing that, they will understand that their autonomy, doing that is much, much better than what they will never uh, be able to get, which is a state. So I, I think that the Republicans are really deep into loving the plan. The Democrats are, some of them are a little bit more hesitant, uh, but I didn't hear a huge no. So that's why I'm a little bit more optimistic that we'll be able to push this uh, uh, ahead because there's a rationale behind the planning. The rationale behind the planning is how do we coexist? This is a lot of my experience in Yerushalayim. Um, when you have that kind of philosophy, you have to deal with everyone uh, and you have some fundamental uh, um, assumptions that before you start planning that makes sense, then eventually they understand that it's not just political and ideological, there's lots of practicalities in it. I, I'm curious to also ask if you had any feedback from Palestinians, because this seems to be like a win-win that will be good for them also. The, the, the Palestinian people like it. The Palestinian Authority doesn't like it uh, because they understand um, the, the people just get triple the amount of, of pay. Their pay grade grows up and uh, goes up and uh, the Palestinians that work uh, in Israel have a far, far better economic future than the ones that don't. So yes, they do. We have about 100,000 people that cross the fence every day. They prefer to cross the fence because they, their pay grade is four or five times higher than at home. The Palestinian Authority understands um, that uh, the dependency on Israel grows. Uh, and that's why they don't like it. In other words, they prefer poor people 
that suffer uh, under their control, then more successful people that less suffer or are happy with their lives, uh, that they have less grip on them, which is unfortunately the story of the Palestinians. Thank you. Uh, from national board member, Paul Tartel, uh, how do we counter the NGO efforts to build in Area C in order to stake a claim to the land of Palestinians? Oh, that's, I, I was mentioning that. Let me put it in, in a different way. We planned our part. And now we demand from them to do the same in a symmetrical way. So my plan talks about how we grow to 2 million uh, Israelis. It's an additional one and a half million. It's 4X. We go four times larger, uh, more than we are today in 30 years. We must demand the Palestinians to do the same. Go to your cities in areas A and in areas B, scale them. Here's the way to do it. We demand you to do what we are doing and leave the uh, open areas in areas, not just in, in area C, in C and B and A, okay? There are uh, cities and open areas. You mustn't touch open areas. Go and focus on your cities, scale them. And this is uh, ideologically, I want the Europeans and I want the Americans to help us preserve open green land. You mustn't build on every inch of, uh, of the land. Uh, you know, it's, it's terrible to earth, to mother earth. This is something that is one of, the, one of the top three values of the European Union, preserve green areas. They don't apply it in Yudav Shomon. And so what, uh, I forgot the name of uh, Brian, if, if you, who asked the question? Uh, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a, oh, Paul Tartel, sorry. Yes. yes. Paul so yeah, what Paul, Paul was, was asking, is because if you don't come with rationale, the Europeans are, are supporting them. And my rationale is here's how we live together in the next few hundred years in our region. Okay. Let's condense our cities and towns. You must do the same. Leave the open areas alone. And we will fight the, anybody that wants to build in an open area the same way we fight back home in Yerushalayim and in Tel Aviv, in the center of Israel. And by the way, the same way they fight in Europe and in the United States, we wanna preserve the open areas of earth. Uh, and that's why we must fight with them. We give them a solution. We show them as an ideology that we, uh, we, we will always, Jews are allowed to live anywhere they want in the, in the world. The era where Jews are not allowed to build is over. So here is where Jews want to live and build in the area, in, in, in state-owned land, uh, in area C, here's my plan. Uh, and that's what we must demand for them to do symmetrically. Then we could tackle much, much easier the, um, the, the, um, the plan that they have to build in area C. Uh, I think we'll take two more questions. So one question, I'll, I'll, it's a question from Steven Gertzoff, also a donor society member. Uh, I'll put it in my own words. Uh, we know that much of the motivation for the conflict between uh, Israelis uh, and Palestinians is from uh, an extremist Islamic ideology. Uh, and much of your plan is speaking about economic uh, incentives. Uh, do you think that you, you'll be able to, uh, to convince uh, to, to, to bring an end to a conflict with Islamic motivations through economic incentives? No. Unfortunately, the radical Islam is not going, is not going away. Uh, I anticipate, you know, people talk about anywhere between 15% of the, of the Muslims are radical, which is a big number, unfortunately. And they're not going to go away. Uh, the, 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 the economic solution is not going to change the radical Islam uh, uh, movement. Uh, with them, you got to be very tough. You got to be bad with the bad guys and good with the good guys. Uh, and so our goal is to be good with the good guys, the ones that are not radical, the ones that do want to improve quality of life. As my experience as mayor of Jerusalem, the majority of uh, the Arabs in, in Jerusalem uh, care about their kids' quality of life and education and jobs and uh, uh, housing, they, you know, the majority of uh, the majority of them, uh, uh, we should, uh, you know, look at them and, and help them as human beings. That's what Jews are about. 
at the same time, fight radical Islam very aggressively, pursue them all over the world, and don't get confused. Unfortunately, this is something that is going to stay for a long, long time, and we have to combat and fight it. You, you actually asked the, uh, answered the last question I wanted to ask, which was uh, how your role of, uh, as mayor of Jerusalem uh, helped you understand also, uh, when, as you dealt with the East Jerusalem, helped you understand the, 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 how to deal with the conflict. So you answered that. I just uh, maybe will give more t a chance to ask a last question if he has a question. If not, then we'll just wind down. No. Uh, well, I think we should let, give the last question to a donor society member. I've already asked two. Uh, so, so we we actually went through all the questions that we needed. Oh, to we did. Through. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, let, let me just say, this plan was enlightening to me and to ZOA. I think I speak on behalf of ZOA. When we get it in English, we will disseminate it and even talk to members of Congress about it. Uh, it sounds like something that's really will be a tremendous benefit to Israel and inadvertently or intentionally the Palestinian Arabs as well. So thank you for your thoughts. And I'm not surprised that the son of a physics professor has such creative thoughts. Thank you. Um, I, I'd be happy. I, thank you very much. It's an honor for me. Dan, uh, I'd like, if you'd like to help me on this issue, I'd be happy to uh, uh, translate it and update it because there's a few things that we could update. This is a version that I showed you as a version of a few months ago. And we've upgraded that since. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, be in touch. <laughs> God bless you. And uh, see you in happier occasions than, uh, than the last few days. Thank you so much, Nir. Oh, uh, I, I, I have to also say as, a, as an Israeli personally that I'm very inspired by the fact that uh, we have political leaders that know how to plan and to think ahead with vision. Uh, it, it's not very often that this happens in Israel. And so I want to say thank you for, for acting this way. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation, which again was fascinating. Uh, I want to let everyone know that this is part of our uh, Zoom uh, event that we started after COVID. Uh, if you liked this uh, during COVID uh, and that we're continuing now in order to bring you some quality content, both from Israel and sometimes also from the US. Uh, if you like this program, so we rely uh, on your help to bring you quality programs such as today's uh, and, we, uh, and in order to continue to do our important work. So please go to our website, click the donate button and be as generous as you can. Thank you again, Nir, and we hope to cooperate in order to promote this plan.